What is up YouTube fam, Robbie C here, and I wanna start off by asking the important question. How are you doing today, Daniel? You having a good one? Today, we're gonna to address the all important question and one that we come across on the In The Bag podcast quite often, talking about Griffin discs. When is a disc too beat in to still stay in my bag? So catch me if I fall. If you guys remember, the last time I was at this course, I was actually in the process of trying to beat in this new Birdie Fam Star Pole Cat that I have to try to get it to a sort of more usable state compared to what I've been using with this watermelon dyed Halo Pole Cat that I've had in the bag for over a year now. The question that I have to ask myself though is, which one of these actually flies like a pole cat? And I think a lot of times when players have these like super beat in discs in their bag or they have a brand new disc in their bag, we will often say something along the lines of, well, that's not flying how it should. But who is to say what a disc should actually fly like? In terms of the pole cat, and it's flight. I've got five different polecats here to kind of demonstrate things throughout the video. Is a polecat supposed to fly like this beat-in version of the Halo Star Plastic that I have? Is this supposed to fly like this newer premium plastic Star Plastic I have? Is it supposed to fly like this 160 gram DX polecat? Is it supposed to fly like a brand new DX polecat? Or is it supposed to fly like this DX polecat that has definitely come in contact with several trees? You see, the tricky part is when we're trying to put a mold in our bag, I think too often we try to ask what the disc should fly like rather than seeing what the disc we actually have in our hands is flying like. So in the case of something like my pole cat that I come to quite often, I know that I have a certain shot that I love using my pole cat for. But there are other shots that if the pole cat is understable enough or shapeable enough that I'm going to be able to unlock certain things. So that means that I will be throwing my pole cat a lot while I'm out there on the course, which is going to cause it to beat in over time, which when a disc beats in, that simply means that it's being used while it's out there on the course, causing it to have a little bit of a different flight than it may have when you first put it in the bag. While I think that there are people out there who believe this shouldn't be the case and that once a disc stops flying like it's supposed to, that you should pull it out of the bag, I think we can actually harness this change to our advantage, but there are a few warnings and things to consider during that process. So we're gonna throw all five of these today on quite a few holes and talk about the strengths and weaknesses of beating in a disc and when it becomes too beat in. All right, let's start with the brand new Halo Bowl cap. Or let's start with the brand new Star Bowl cap. Okay. That's pretty nice. We'll then go with watermelon, the beat in one. We'll go with the brand new Max Weight DX. We'll go with the lightweight, not as used DX. Yikes. And then we're gonna go with the first DX pole cat that I fell in love with that is definitely beat in. That was so nosy, but I love it. So let's start with the obvious question. How should a disc fly? I think that when manufacturers are assigning flight number to a disc, I really appreciate when they are willing to modify that flight number based on the plastic type that they've created. Take the turn from Innova, for example, when it's in, wow, that was cool, uh, beat in, nice. When the turn is in any other plastic other than Champion, it has minus three turn, or yet when it's in Champion plastic, it is minus two turn, because that Champion plastic is supposed to make it more or overstable, which means that it won't have as much turn naturally. So when manufacturers are willing to acknowledge that the plastic will change the effect of the flight of the disc, I think it's super helpful if they'll actually adjust the flight numbers for us as well, because that gives us insight into how it should actually fly. Although different runs can always come out more overstable or understable than even they're intending for that to be within that specific plastic type. So flight number 
members, although helpful to get the conversation started, are not the end all be all when it comes to how the disc should fly. For me, I think that flight numbers represent what a disc should do in its flight when thrown flat by a professional with enough arm speed and the ability to inject enough spin and power into the disc to actually cause the disc to reach its full potential. The way that you can see these thresholds is the first number in the flight numbers, which is the speed of the disc. And higher the speed doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna go farther. It actually just means that it needs more spin and power injected into the disc upon its release in order for the rest of the numbers to even matter. But when talking about something like a polecat, which is a one speed, this is the lowest possible threshold that can exist among a disc, which is why the polecat is a fantastic disc for even playing catch. These type of discs are lovingly referred to in the disc golf community as lids because although they shouldn't necessarily have to be thrown off the tee, they're very fantastic for scrambling or short upshot approaches. And if you're looking to warm up, I always suggest having a polecat around to play catch and get loose. But with that being said, I do actually believe that if you have a disc like this, you can throw it off the tee. And I quite often will throw my polecats off the tee on a regular basis. Even though I only have one in my bag, I kind of have to make the decision with having one in my bag. When is enough enough? And what type of polecat should I have in my bag for that exact reason? Now, I'm gonna go ahead and make a statement here that's either gonna be super controversial and y'all are gonna head to the comments and roast me for it, or lots of you are gonna go, yeah, I believe it. And I can't believe no one's ever said that in a video before. I actually believe that the flight numbers of any disc do not actually pertain to what it should fly like when it's picked up off the shelf. We have to understand that we are throwing plastic discs. So every time that it hits the ground or it hits a tree, actually it's going to wear into the plastic a little bit. And so manufacturers understand that even thrown into an open field, there is going to be, although minimal, very minimal wear and tear on the disc. So I think that manufacturers are actually trying to describe what the flight of the disc should fly like once it's used and thrown on a flat shot by a professional who can throw it with enough speed to get into the disc. So I think that a lot of the reason people get super frustrated with discs is because they will pick them up off the shelf and think that, oh yeah, I'm looking at these flight numbers and this should be perfect. And ha, that's just not what it's flying like. All right, we're gonna go watermelon polka here to get started. Okay. Inside the Mando. Let's go lightweight and just yam it. Oh, nope. I really struggle when I know I put something too understable in my hands to actually throw it online. Okay, Dennis. They're not all flippy, so you're gonna have to actually throw one through the gap, brother. I mean, that makes sense. I'm aimed going that way, so let's do a little T-box geometry. Yeah, that was the beat in DX Polecat. And then this is the new one that we're working with. 281 feet to the pin. Stay up. Yeah. So knowing that it takes a little bit to beat in a disc in terms of like getting it to actually fly like the flight numbers that you're looking for, how do you choose what type of plastic you should get or what type of plastic you should bag for that disc? Well, the first way is to really think about it in a sense of you don't know until you throw it. So if you have a mold that looks interesting and you know it comes in a variety of plastic types, especially if you have friends that already have access to those or friends that maybe have backups of those plastics, ask if you can try them for a week, ask if you can borrow them for a couple of weeks even to give a chance to really feel them out and see which one flies closer to the line that you want the disc to actually fly on. Remember that we're trying to approach the disc to see what it does rather than hoping it will do a certain thing for us. It's gonna lead to way less fresh when trying out plastic as well as a better understanding and relationship with the disc that you have in your bag. So the analogy that I'll use, and I was trying to think of what the right thing is, trying to think like ice cube versus iceberg, but I feel like that's too dramatic. Then I was thinking of maybe a rock versus a boulder, but I don't know if the 
science holds up there with what I want to say, but let's go with that one. Base plastic is our rock in this situation, and premium plastic is going to be our boulder. With the right tools and the right technology, there is no world that a rock is ever going to be able to go as far or have as long term of a status as the boulder will. With elements coming in and chipping off pieces over time, the rock is going to lose its integrity way faster than the boulder is going to. And when it comes to trying out plastic, this carries through as well. If you have a base plastic disc, the beauty of this is that it's going to beat into a sweet spot or that more closer to the desired flight numbers a lot faster. That's because this is a cheaper plastic, which also means that it's going to be cheaper to purchase as well. So there's a lot easier to replace those type of options. But you can even see if you look at the detail of this specific DX pole cap that I had in my bag for probably three to four months and it got beat up to this level of wear and tear. Really, yeah, just kind of chiseled and all that. And then you look at this premium plastic pole cap that I had in my bag and it has been in my bag for a year now and it doesn't look near as worn and torn even though it's been thrown, I would say 10 times more than this DX pole cap. With that being said, this DX pole cap has a little bit more of a naturally understable flight than this particular hair low star pole cat but the other beautiful part is is that this dx pole cat is one serious tree kick away from being a drastically different flight whereas with a more premium plastic option i can really hit a tree pretty hard and it's still going to maintain the flight that i'm looking for out of the disc this shot has the potential to look really cool halo pole cat first turn for me baby we're gonna go new dx Oh yeah, yeah, that even had a little fight at the end. Okay, lightweight, DX. Oh yeah, she's flippy. All right, beat in DX. Oh yeah, see how much further left we started that? And it still gets all the way over there. Woo, the star birdie. Yeah, it's not even burning over. That's kind of nasty. Ooh, I like it, the pole cat day. So traditionally, if you're looking for a more understable flight sooner rather than later out of a disc, or if you want a disc that, oh, that was bad, then maybe going to a base plastic is the play for you to try out that mold or make sure that it has an easy <laughs> slot or guaranteed slot in the back. Okay. I would say, however, though, if you have the time to really work with the disc and spend some time beating it in, which is kind of what I'm doing with this new star pole cat. Although I love this halo pole cat, the closest I have, if this were to suddenly find its way into the water, is this beat in DX pole cat, which is still a little bit different. And like I said, one bad tree kick and this thing's dead and never gonna fly the same afterwards. So having a backup that is ready to go, the season in that I'm ready to throw, is gonna allow me the confidence to continue throwing this disc. I'm gonna go ahead and say that I think there is nothing wrong with having a Griffin disc or nothing wrong with having a disc that flies maybe a little more seasoned or a little more beat in than what you would expect out of a disc of its kind. But if you get to a point where you're no longer throwing that specific disc on certain shots because you're afraid of losing it, then that means it might be time to start working in a replacement. Which also brings me into the beauty of choosing whether you want that DX option or the premium plastic option in your bag. To take my rock and boulder analogy a step further, if I'm looking for a fun thing to do for an afternoon or an hour. I'm gonna head down to the creek or the water and I'm gonna grab rocks and I'm gonna start skipping them across the water. There is a joy to that and I can get into it pretty fast and experience the fullness of that activity. And that's what DX Plastic allows you to do. It also makes it easily replaceable. If I were trying to skip rocks across the water and one of them didn't skip all the way across, I can simply walk over and find other rocks that will accomplish the same thing. Falling in love with a base plastic disc is exactly that. It should be easily 
easily replaceable and it's gonna get to that sweet spot really fast. Now the hard part is if you fall in love with a premium plastic disc, although it could in theory quote be harder to replace because it's beat into that lovely usable state, the biggest con of using a premium plastic also leads to its greatest strength, which is that it's going to take more time for that premium plastic disc to beat into that beautiful place. But once it reaches that sweet spot, it's going to hold it way longer than ever before. For example, just looking at these two discs, which have both served pivotal slots in my bag, this one only stayed in there for a few months because it was already getting to a point where I was having to be so touchy with the disc while using it on the course that I found myself leaning on it a little less just because it wasn't too understable. It was just too touchy for me to consistently feel like I could use out on the course because different wind conditions and things like that would cause me to not necessarily step up and want to throw it. However, this premium plastic polecat is still flying exactly how I want it to fly and it's been doing so for I would say the last six to seven months because in the same amount of time that it took this DX disc to come into its sweet spot and almost move past it is the same amount of time that it took me to get this disc to its sweet spot and it still hasn't left. We're gonna keep the camera on me because that means that I have a much higher chance of acing this hole. Oh, yep. Or, or, hear me out, hit first available. Yeah, lightweight. I think I'm gonna go with bulkhead on this one. Well, those are actually all very bad ace runs, but uh, I think literally four of them were parked. Notice that the greatest sculptures in the world were not made out of rocks that people are skipping across the water. They're made out of boulders and larger stones that someone saw the beauty in. Well, that really ruined the cinematic moment we had going, didn't it there, Mr. Polecat? Okay. They're made out of beautiful, large pieces of stone that someone saw a beauty in and said, I know what lies underneath. And that's the kind of relationship that you can have with a premium plastic disc that you really get and love and lean into. Once again, I understand that there is a beauty to the DX disc being in your bag, and I'm not the guy who's gonna be like, hey, you should avoid base plastic at all costs inside of your bag. I just think that there is a beauty to both, and if you're looking to find that Griffin disc or to find a disc that you can lean on quite often, then I would I highly suggest grabbing a premium plastic version of the disc that you're trying to work in and work with and spend a lot of time playing one disc rounds with just that disc. What that's gonna do is not only are you gonna hit trees and things like that because you're trying to shape it onto lines that maybe it's not designed for, but you're gonna get really comfortable feeling that disc out and seeing what it can and can't do. But also you're guaranteed to get scuffs and hits on the disc because it has to go into the chains every time. Even if you're putting with a tumbleweed or you're putting with your lariat or you're putting with your war pigeon, whatever it may be, having the time to play that one disc round is gonna be super helpful for it. But before we wrap up, I wanna give one last set of warnings for you to identify, hey, maybe this disc has become a Griffin disc and I need to start taking the steps forward to replacing it what do I need to do? First, if you do fall in love with the base plastic disc and find a lot of use for it, I know I personally have found that in our pro pigs in my bag, I would highly suggest cycling them, which means that you're gonna have multiples of it in the bag that you're using for the different stages of flight wear and tear. What that can mean for pole cats is that can mean that I have this as a more straight option and this is a more flippy option. And as this becomes more flippy, it falls into the flippy slot. This goes into a backup reserve waiting for a rainy day that I lose a disc and then I put a new DX Polecat in the bag as well as an option. But let's say that I haven't had the chance to work this into a flippy state and I lose this one because I throw a bad shot, the wind gets a hold of it, whatever happens to be the case. Usually grabbing a more lighter weight version of the disc will allow you to have more control and allow you to more easily put spin and power into the shot, which could in theory create more understable options. I'm not saying that because it's lighter weight that makes it more understable. I'm saying that because it's lighter weight, it makes it easier 
easier to put power and spin into the disc, which is gonna cause you to be able to almost overpower the disc, which could in theory make you think that you're throwing it in a more understable option. My favorite form of cycling comes with my pigs. I keep three pigs in my bag. I have my precious child, which is the most understable of all of them. And it definitely doesn't fly anything like a pig anymore. I then have a straight pig, which still has a tiny bit of stability to it, but most of the time I can just throw it dead straight and know that I'm not gonna overjuice it and turn it over, but it's also not gonna like go hard left on me when I throw it on a backhand. And then I always keep a newer pig in my bag that's more overstable, more torque resistant, all of those things, so that it can fly truly like a pig on those shots. So when my straight pig becomes no longer straight, it goes into a reserve bin to back up Precious Child. And if my most overstable pig is ready, it slides into that middle option and I put a new overstable pig in the back. We're gonna start with the overstable one. Punch through, nope, punch through. We had to flirt with the red tree line. These I can go a little more flat on because they're not as stable. Whoop, whoop. Don't have to crank on these. That's wet. Splish, splash, I was taking, oh, it stayed up. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Oh no, the trees are gonna straighten that out. That's definitely wet. Nope, I'm just small, super short. I would say the three signs that you have a Griffin disc that you need to start banking a backup for or getting ready. Wow, we're just lazy on the putts today. Three signs that you have a Griffin disc that you need to start banking a backup for. One, you never throw it near danger. Whenever there is water that you could possibly lose it on or maybe even grassy ravine or like tall grass or something and you're like, wow, it'd be a real bummer if I lost this disc. It is definitely time to start working on a backup because that fear alone may keep you from throwing that disc on that shot, even if it is the best option for that shot. We wanna make sure that when we're walking into a golf course, that we have the opportunity to throw the best shot on the hole to help ourselves succeed, even if that brings a little danger into play sometimes. I would say the second sign is when other people start noticing how well you're throwing that particular disc, especially when they start making comments about like, hey, that's not how that's supposed to fly, things like that. There are players out there who are constantly paying attention to what other people are throwing and then there are players out there who I would say are more the majority who are kind of focused in on their own game and struggling to not hit trees to begin with. I'm not saying it's time for that disc to leave your bag but I am saying that it's time for you to start having a backup ready. Point 2B to that would be when you find yourself sort of frustrated with the disc because you already know that it doesn't fly like it's supposed to. It keeps overturning or it keeps doing a more exaggerated form of what you want it to do and so you you start losing a little faith in it due to its unreliability while you're out there on the course. And the third sign that you may have a Griffin disc is that at night you have dreams about that disc or nightmares of you losing that disc. This is Teresa. I dream of her. But there's also a chance that that's like an addiction or like a therapy thing, so. I don't feel qualified to like actually fully address that. I just know that it may be time for a new backup. I feel like a majority of Griffin discs or discs that are super special end up being an overstable disc that has been beat into either neutral or understable option. But you do have rare instances like I have with these kittens of the pole variety who you take a neutral to understable disc and you fall even more in love with it, maybe because you even found it in an overstable plastic. But I would love to hear in the comments below, what is your Griffin disc? What's that disc that you have in your bag that's super beat in or super unique that you absolutely love throwing and you've often even seen your friends talk about it and perhaps you have a shot when I keep talking about like losing it or dreaming about losing it or even not wanting to throw it over water this disc came to mind for you or even tag a friend and say hey he's definitely talking about you and your blank I would love to know in the comments down below so that we can relate over uh, what is your precious child in the meantime I hope this video was helpful and I hope that if you have one of those discs or you've been jealous of people who have a certain disc that they have that reliability to because if you're newer to the game, you may not have discovered that special relationship with a mold or a certain disc yet and know that it takes time and it takes a lot of rounds playing with it to get that comfortable relationship. I also wanna know how short I fell with my boulder and rock analogy because I definitely felt a little reaching. In the meantime, I wanna say thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you have an amazing rest of the week and that you can make a fantastic for someone else too. Thank you as always for tuning in and we're gonna try something special
special today. We got five shots. Let's see if we can leave you with an ace rather than a birdie. How's that sound? Boop, 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 boop. Okay, that's definitely stuck in a tree. Oh, that's too low, Mr. Crawford. Give it a chance. I liked the height. Drop. All right, we tasted metal. For now, we're gonna leave you with the birdie.